Hi, my name is Alan Holub, and this 10-minute mini-lecture is an introduction to what I call design by coding. Uh, uh, DBC is a technique that I use to build agile systems. I'm working incrementally in the code, but I don't want to give up on the notions of design or the notions of architecture for that matter. So DBC provides you a way of doing design while you're coding and doing the whole thing incrementally. I'll describe how the process works, and later on I'll give you a quick demo. So DBC is really a variation on both test and behavior-driven development, or TDD and BDD, as they're commonly called. Although people think of both T and BDD as testing methodologies, in fact, they're really both design strategies. And DBC just scales TDD and BDD to think about things at the architectural and the design levels rather than strictly at the coding level. All three techniques do yield a bunch of tests as a byproduct of the process, but the tests are in a way a side effect of the process. They're not the main deal. So let's look at how DBC works. At some point or another, every one of us has wrestled with some library that got the API wrong. There are too many arguments to the methods. There are too many methods. Things are way too complicated. You've got to go through 16 steps where one ought to do. You know the drill. At some point, you stop and you say to yourself, did the clown who came up with this junk actually use it to do anything? The answer usually is no. The clown in question probably designed the system up front and he tried to guess everything that you'd want to do with it. And that guessing is a problem. You can never guess right, for one thing. And the clown is at a disadvantage in that there's no way for him to guess how exactly you're going to be using the system. So he designs it to be way more complicated than it needs to be to cover every possible eventuality. And all of those possibilities just get in the way when it's time to actually use the system. So instead of just guessing, it's much better to build the system around the code that's actually using it. That is, instead of trying to write the subsystem first, you write the code that's going to use the subsystem first. Once you get a usable interface to the subsystem, you can then implement it. And as you implement it, you can adjust that interface as necessary. So you start out with a small chunk of a real story, piece of real code. And as you work, you invent the interface that you want to talk to. The subsystem's interface doesn't really exist when you write the code that's going to be using the subsystem. What you're doing is inventing the interface that you wish existed. As you work, the interfaces are going to change. You're going to discover new things about the code as you add new pieces or as you modify things or as you learn more about the story. And that's perfectly natural. This is the whole point, in fact, of working the way that we're working, that we're coding to an interface which hasn't been implemented yet, so these kinds of changes are easy to do. Finally, since the story is driving the process, both the code and the design that we come up with is structured in a way that maps directly to the real world. Consequently, it's easy to change the program when the real world requirements change, which they will do in an agile environment. All right, let's look at DBC in action. This demo is a little abbreviated by necessity. We only have 10 minutes after all. However, you'll still see all the essential parts of the process in action. I'll be focusing on architecture, though, not on the minutia of the TDD process that underlies DBC. And I'll use login as our case study, mostly because login is a small but interesting part of many of the real-world stories that we all work on. I'll start by writing the story down on a small index card. This is a story in the literal sense of the word, a short narrative that takes place within a fictional milieu called the system metaphor. In this case, the metaphor is a guard, a door, with a box full of signature cards. All of the stories are set in the same milieu, which is one of the things that gives us a coherent architecture. I should say that a lot of people who do Agile incorrectly define a story as an alias for a feature request. That's fundamentally wrong. A story is a story. The definition is the same one you'd find in any English dictionary. The next step is that you need to identify the roles. These are often called actors, but the term actor makes no sense in this context. We're interested in the roles that the actors take on, not the actors themselves. For example, if the same person logs on to a system, sometimes in the role of a manager and sometimes in the role of an employee, but he does different things depending on the role that he logged on in, then the fact that it's the same person who's logged on in two different roles really doesn't matter. It's the roles that count. The interesting roles in the current story are the guard, a signature, a signature card, a customer, and a card file. At least that's where we can start. So let's look at the process in action. Here's an empty JUnit test file that already has the imports and an empty class already in place to take the test. I usually work in a single file when I'm designing, and later on I'll split out the various class definitions and interfaces into separate files, but for now it's easier to just put it all in one place. 
The first order of business is to mock up our story in the form of a simple test. Following the behavior-driven design convention, I'll use a name that describes the results I'm looking for with should in it. It's not an accident that the method name mirrors the story. The goal, in fact, is to design something that matches the story as closely as possible. Since the guard starts things off in the story, I'll do the same thing in the code. I'll create a guard, then I'll tell it to sign in a customer. It's up to the guard to display whatever UI is necessary to do that. Since this is a test, I'll now add an assert to make sure that things worked right. But what am I going to assert on? That's the first flaw in our incipient design. I've got nothing to assert on. So let's go back and modify the interface to return a success status. Now, how's the guard going to do its work? Looking back up at the story, he'll need to look up the user information in a card file, so let's create a card file and stick a user in it. It seems natural for the file to be a singleton, so I'll code it like that. I can always change my mind later if I get it wrong. As I'm working, I see another problem. A Boolean status isn't really good enough here because I have no way to test that the guard has logged in the correct person. More to the point, I know as a fact that I'll need some sort of login token to use with future requests, and I just don't have one here. The problem's actually in our story, so let's go back and fix that first by introducing the notion of a badge. Then, let's go down and match the code to the story that we just changed. I'll fix the old assert to handle the new reality, then I'll add another to make sure that the badge is valid. Now let's get it to compile. I need to create the most minimal version of the classes that we've just added. This is just rote code, so I'll do it using the miracle of time-lapse photography. There's one final issue to address here. The story talks about a signature card, and right now that card is buried in the card file where we can't see it. There's a maintenance issue, though. I'm assuming that I can create a signature card with nothing but a customer name and password. But at some point, I might want to add more information to the card. I'll solve that problem now by making the card explicit at the current level. Instead of passing the username and password into the register new customer call, I'll create a card and pass the username and password into the constructor for the card. That way, if I decide to change the requirements for a signature card later on, all I need to do is change that constructor and then I'm done. So it looks like we've arrived at a reasonable design now. From here on, I'd start applying test-driven development techniques to build out the rest of the implementation, but I'm not going to do that in this particular class. So let's summarize. You start with a story, a short narrative that shows the system in action. The story takes place in a particular milieu, a system metaphor, and uses actors in specific roles. Then I implement the story as code, using the roles as the object and class names, and choosing method names that make sense in the context of the metaphor. Because of that one-to-one -one connection between the story and the code, when, not if, the story changes, it's easy to change the code too. I'll work iteratively, fixing problems as they come up, and when I'm done, I'll have the minimal interface and set of classes that I need to implement the story, and more to the point, everything will work in the easiest way possible. So that's designed by coding.